Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, let us start our meeting. And thank you very much for all of you who are here physically and also those who are online. I know it's difficult for some of you, especially in the late hours or early mornings. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, as you know, this is the town hall um, where the tech envoy, Under Secretary General Amandeep Singhal, is going to meet with the um, IG community. And he's going to tell us a bit about um, the Tech Envoy's office, the plans for the future, the GDC, um, et cetera. And then we're going to take some questions. Um, this meeting is being recorded, and um, we are going to have a copy of the recording later for those of us who could not um, join. And with that, um, I would like to introduce the Under Secretary General. Thank you very much, Changatai. Thank you to the IGF Secretariat for organizing this meeting. And uh, thank you very much to the IGF community uh, for turning up. Uh, I know uh, busy days and you have a uh, uh, lot on your minds and on your calendars. So really appreciate uh, uh, that you've taken the time and join uh, this, this discussion. I thought I'll divide my remarks today into three parts. Firstly, tell you a little bit about the uh, Office of the Tech Envoy, the background, um, how are we organized? What are the priorities? What's the vision for the future? And second, tell you about um, the global digital compact process and um, how that relates to the uh, broader agenda of the summit of the future. It's, it's one among many pieces uh, that'll be taken up at that time. And finally, um, third part of my intervention, just want to um, get into some details about um, how we work with the IGF community, how our, our vision is around that, uh, the existing kind of touch points, but also new ones that are emerging, uh, looking at the upcoming meetings in Addis Ababa, then uh, in Japan next year. So if that's okay, let me just go ahead and uh, get into uh, uh, the, the substance of my remarks. And apologies to those who heard me earlier today uh, or in recent days. Uh, if, uh, uh, if you have things to attend to on your device, uh, please go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, there was... Um, uh, this reflection in 2018, 2019 on digital cooperation at the initiative of the UN Secretary General, uh, which led to um, a report, the report of the high level panel on digital cooperation. Uh, it's a set of five recommendations. Uh, some of you may have read that report. Um, it had a chapter on digital governance issues. Um, and uh, um, since there is no silver bullet for almost anything, it proposed three models of digital cooperation, and one of them, the Internet Governance Forum Plus model, recognizing the very important central role that the IGF uh, plays, uh, mul uh, plays through uh, a multi-stakeholder approach. Uh, and then there were some specific recommendations around digital inclusion, addressing the digital divide, building up data commons, AI commons. Um, and uh, one of the recommendations was about the need for the UN to have a tech envoy. And uh, these uh, reflections were taken forward by, through the Secretary General's roadmap on digital cooperation. And then in the context of the 75th anniversary of the uh, United Nations, uh, there was um, uh, a recognition, uh, the member states recognize that among the 12 important things that they are going to strive for um, 
in the context of that solemn occasion, one of them was going to be to accelerate digital cooperation. Uh, so in a sense, digital moved uh, to the, the front of the, uh, the policy agenda, just as with the WISIS process in 2003, 2005, this whole issue of an information society, what kind of role does internet play in our lives, how should we get together around that, you know, move to uh, be one of those defining uh, issues. It's been a while coming, but here it is. Uh, digital is one of the, uh, the priority items on the international agenda. Uh, the member states asked the Secretary General to uh, produce a report, and uh, um, he did that on the occasion of the 75th anniversary. Uh, and this is uh, uh, our common agenda. That's the title of that report. Uh, and he underlined uh, the priority to be accorded to the digital space and the need to protect the online space and strengthen its governance. Uh, and this is where uh, the Global Digital Compact was first mentioned uh, to be developed through a multi-stakeholder track, uh, which would outline shared principles for an open, free, and secure digital future for all. Uh, and, and this commons approach um, uh, is worth reflecting a little bit on. Uh, we are used to dealing with many commons in our daily lives. Uh, uh, common public spaces that we all use responsibly. There are some rules and regulations, uh, and the purpose there is not to bind us hand, hand and feet, uh, but to facilitate the usage of those commons for the, the public good. And then, you know, you can spiral up and look at the maritime commons. You can look at outer space, many areas which do not belong to one person or one entity. Uh, in, in, in fact, traditional notions of kind of, you know, ownership and proprietary rights uh, are, are, are to be seen differently in those spaces. Uh, and digital has become, uh, over the years, one of those global commons. Uh, you are all steeped in the Internet, and you know that's a global asset. It's a global public infrastructure of sorts. Uh, and so it's natural for uh, us to look at the digital space, even though it's an artificial construct, unlike many of the other commons, uh, the, our planet, it's, it's a natural uh, construct, the maritime domain as well. The digital domain is a bit of a human construct, technological construct, a soci socio-technological construct, uh, but it's helpful to look at it in terms of the commons, similar problems because no one really owns it. Sometimes no one really cares for it. Uh, and um, and there, are, there is misuse, uh, there are risks, uh, and therefore you need to find ways to work together to address the misuse and the risks, but also need to find ways to make sure that everyone can use it inclusively, that it's not a club, it's a commons. So this is a bit of the background uh, uh, to that, uh, that approach. Um, on 4th August this year, the Secretary General gave a speech uh, at the UN General Assembly where he outlined some of the areas uh, that could feature in the uh, Global Digital Compact. Uh, and this was just uh, uh, kind of a few weeks after I joined as the tech envoy. Um, and... Um, uh, one of the mandates that the SG has given me is to support the development of the Global Digital Compact, support the uh, digital track for the summit of the future, which will have these other pieces, outer space, the climate change issue, a new agenda for peace, you know, many of the challenges that we are facing today. The larger idea being to reboot multilateralism, uh, to bring some more dynamism and energy into the SDGs agenda, which has suffered a setback uh, with COVID uh, and with the situation today on energy security, food insecurity, and the, um, and the debt burden, and, and so on. Now, this was a bit of the background. Now, what are the priorities uh, for the tech invoice office? 
uh, when you say tech, it is today largely digital tech and its interface uh, with some other emerging technologies. Uh, so, um, yes, we are today in the context of the IGF, which looks at the internet and all the applications, the content there is on top, the the protocol layer, the infrastructure layer, you know, we are familiar with those three layers, but then there is a larger digital uh, world. Uh, you have some new emerging technologies. Uh, you'll have intelligent networks in the future. At the end of the day, the internet is a network of networks, so you may have different ways to uh, to uh, to approach um, and the networking uh, challenge. So we need to look at those as well. Uh, quantum computing, which may shift us from a binary world in terms of how we organize information to a different way of organizing information, different sets of challenges around um, uh, cryptography, inclusion, uh, etc. Uh, and, uh, and so on. So that's the broader context in terms of the mandate um, uh, uh, insofar as tech is concerned. And then uh, we've been asked to be the focal point on digital cooperation, which means being the one stop for different stakeholders, civil society, private sector, governments, international organizations, um, academia, uh, the tech community uh, to discuss these issues uh, because not everyone has the resources to be present in different UN forums and domains. So there is uh, a need, a felt need to have that kind of uh, a single window. Uh, and then this has an inward facing dimension, which is that within the UN system, you have different agencies with their own mandates. ITU, for instance, has a very strong mandate in terms of standard setting, digital inclusion, capacity development, cybersecurity, and so on. So uh, they have a, a role, UNDP, uh, with its network on the ground, working with member states on development issues. They have a role, UNESCO, in terms of ethics, in terms of the information piece, uh, in a sense. Uh, the sociocultural piece, and, and so on. So how do we have more of a one UN perspective? How do we collaborate to be more effective and more responsive to member state needs? So that's part of this, um, uh, this part of uh, our work. The second part is uh, harnessing the digital opportunity to accelerate progress on the SDGs. Um, there is tremendous progress being made by leveraging digital technologies. And we've seen that during COVID, governments which had better digital public infrastructure were able to deliver vaccines faster, were able to manage the burden on the health system better, uh, and so on. Uh, so the message has gone home. If you want resilience uh, to health public health challenges, to disasters, to uh, climate change, you better invest in digital. Um, and then uh, there will be, uh, in the specific domains of health, there'll be no universal health coverage without the leveraging role of digital technologies. In the domain of environment and climate change, there'll be no green transition without uh, data and, and uh, digital. So the green transition and the digital transition go together. The move to UHC and digital go together etc cetera, etc cetera. so there is a specific and important and urgent aspect here uh, which is again uh, is the demand side of the equation so member states are asking how can the un help us leverage the digital opportunity how can we come together better to use digital technologies to measure where we are for instance uh, the data on the sdgs does not have it's not complete, it is not real time, it does not tell you the whole story, so problems remain undiscovered. Uh, and then we don't have enough data to drive the solution making, to drive real time policy. 
So policy needs to be fine-tuned uh, um, in a live manner. So that requires digital. So there are many, I've just given you a few examples, but there are some aspects of this leveraging that we need to uh, focus on in a strategic sense. The solution making, the specific issues, you know, different agencies have their own mandate, uh, member states have their own programs, but who's kind of doing the meta work, you know, who's connecting the dots. Uh, so that's one of the, you know, responsibilities that uh, we've been asked to focus on. Finally, the third pillar is the governance pillar. Uh, here, uh, I mean, if the second pillar was about the opportunity, this one is about challenge. Uh, the threat of misuse, the risks across the three pillars of the UN, peace and security, human rights, and development. Uh, and then uh, the, uh, the issue of human rights online, uh, human freedoms, human agency, uh, protection of vulnerable groups. Uh, so those are all important issues under the governance uh, pillar. Um, I may have neglected to mention a few others. They are all uh, there in some of our statements, some of our reports, misinformation, disinformation, the importance of data protection, and um, giving uh, citizens and communities uh, agency over their own data. So data protection and data empowerment. Uh, so that's, that's going to be under the governance uh, theme. Um, and uh, there will be a reflection on AI. There are several initiatives within the UN system on AI. Uh, so some recent guidelines and guidance has come out. WHO a few months ago came up with uh, uh, guidelines on data and AI for health. UNESCO uh, adopted a recommendation on AI ethics. Uh, so obviously this is a field of interest across the board. And how can we facilitate an exchange of experiences around uh, AI governance across countries, uh, across different domains, and again, extract that meta uh, understanding, which becomes a, a knowledge product uh, of uh, benefit uh, to those who are approaching the digital transformation as governments, as civil society, as academia. Uh, so this is... Uh, uh, an overview of the mandate of the office and its work. We are a small team based in the Secretariat in New York, uh, but uh, we are uh, mighty because we are networked and so working closely with uh, colleagues in DESA and the IGF, very closely with ITU, uh, the uh, different bureaus and the SG, um, other teams, and one example of that collaboration is going to be something we um, will start reflecting on next uh, from next month, uh, a common blueprint on digital transformation, pulling together the best brains within the UN system on digital issues uh, and working towards a kind of a single hymn sheet uh, kind of resource that can be helpful within the UN system and to uh, member states, and also counting on uh, uh, the goodwill, the support of a lot of academic partners, um, civil society partners, and uh, uh, the tech and the, and the business uh, sectors. Now, let me just pivot quickly to the last part of my uh, presentation. I've mentioned the GDC, the Tech Envoys Office, and its mandate. Now, how does the IGF community plug into these? Um, we have um, a call for inputs, uh, which is live on the website. We've extended the deadline. It will be on till 31st March. That's about the time when the first kind of inputs are put together and reflected by the Secretary General on behalf of the Secretariat into this process, which is owned by the President of the General Assembly. Uh, so the preparatory process for the Summit of the Future is led by the PGA. Uh, and the co-facilitators that the PGA will appoint across these different tracks, um, digital being one of those. So we as the Secretariat would support that uh, track, and the first input will go in around that time. And there will be a final input uh, in the form of a report from the, from the SG uh, in June. 
and then we'll have in September the ministerial meeting, which will look at how, um, you know, how, how to move forward into a more active negotiating phase. At what point this phase kicks in, not for me to, uh, to speak on. It's the PGA and the co-facilitators who will judge that, who will uh, evaluate that. We'll be ready to support them, and we are working hard uh, towards the end. There'll be a series, in addition to the public call for inputs, there'll be a series of targeted uh, consultations. Uh, we have started already uh, when the ITU uh, did the partner to connect uh, meeting in Kigali. There was uh, uh, some stock taking there. Recently at the Bucharest planning port, we did a consultation. We've done a civil society town hall during the ANGA in New York, several meetings with the private sector, and I could go on. Um, today is a very important day um, because we are doing these consult today and tomorrow, doing these consultations in Geneva. Geneva's role is obvious. Uh, so different aspects from human rights to standard setting uh, to uh, the sustainable development goals, uh, initiatives are around that. Um, I've also been meeting with colleagues across the UN system to get their sense of what the priorities are, what the challenges are, uh, from UN OSAT to the High Commissioner for Refugees, uh, you know, issues around data protection in, in sensitive humanitarian contexts and so on. Uh, then when the IGF meets in Addis Ababa, uh, the five items on the agenda closely aligned to the themes of the Global Digital Compact. So that'll be a great opportunity for us to have um, uh, more uh, diverse inputs coming into uh, this, uh, this preparation um, and so on. Uh, uh, Germany is, uh, and I'm grateful for that, is helping us organize three regional consultations in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Uh, Malta, which is hosting the Digital Diplomacy Summit next month, is also helping us organize a consultation there with about 200 invitees who will come from different parts of the world. Uh, and I'll be undertaking some targeted visits uh, as well, along with my colleagues, uh, to, to um, make sure that no voice is, no significant important voice is neglected. Depending on resources, we may try for a specific a focus on youth, because if it's the summit of the future, it's about our digital futures, then, you know, we really have to make sure that those who are under 30 are engaged and their voices, their aspirations, whether what's the kind of digital future they want or they wish to have, what are the kind of things they don't want to see, and how should we get there? You know, those are important themes, not only for uh, for uh, us, but for the younger generation uh, as well. So um, let me just uh, finish by saying that uh, we recognize in the UN the importance the, of the IJF. Uh, the IJF leadership panel has been created. Uh, the colleagues in DESA who oversee the IJF secretariat I have worked with, uh, with my office and with the uh, executive office and secretary general to have that put together. They uh, came together in a get to know meeting recently um, uh, prior to the formal start of their work. Uh, so uh, we are there to support your work to make sure that it, is, it, it gets the importance that it deserves. We are there to make sure that uh, uh, your outcomes become more concrete. Uh, they are taken more seriously by policymakers. And we are there to ensure uh, that uh, your uh, agenda uh, reflects uh, what is the uh, shared uh, set of priorities uh, around different parts of the world. And there I'm really uh, uh, delighted to learn of the progress that's being made by the regional IJFs, by the national IJFs. This community is growing. It's becoming uh, more diverse. It's becoming more connected to what's happening in different parts of the world. And that's how it should be. Thank you.
Uh, thank you very much, Amadeep. Um, that was very useful and informative. Um, we are now going to open the floor to questions and um, either online or here in the room. Um, when I call your name, can you please just state your name, um, your organization, and your stakeholder group? Um, those of you in the um, WebEx room, um, you can just uh, raise your hand. You've got the raise hand signal at the bottom of the screen there. And here you can just physically raise your hand if you want to ask a question. So the floor is now open. Yes, please. Yes. Yeah. Hello there. It's um, Emma Gibson from Equality Now. And um, you talked us through the consultation process that you've got planned over the next um, kind of 18 months or so, which sounds very impressive. And I just wanted to ask, you talked about young people, for example, enga engaging them, and that sounds really important. Um, but also because um, the impact of new technologies seems to be disproportionately affecting women um, in a negative way, I was just wondering if you had any particular plans to engage um, women and make sure that women's voices are around the table in your consultation. Thank you. Should I go ahead? Yes. Thank you. Uh, so th that's uh, of fundamental importance. And recently at uh, the UNGA, we launched a new definition of digital inclusion in partnership with UN Women. I think uh, first step in many of these issues is recognizing the extent of the problem and finding ways to measure how, what, how we are doing. Uh, so this we uh, did recently with UN Women, with Canada, with Mexico and other uh, partners from um, academia and the private sector. Uh, so uh, on the youth side, uh, I'm working with the youth envoy, uh, Jayatma, uh, to ensure that we capture uh, youth voices. Uh, we have some ideas, some plans, as I said, depending on the resources, we kind of uh, roll them out uh, to uh, do some um, regional outreach using digital means uh, to um, have uh, students from schools and from universities uh, uh, do reflections on, give inputs, specific inputs into um, the GDC uh, process. So those are some of the... Uh, the ideas that ganz are in the planning that are das, in implementation uh, at this stage. But as I said, you know, we are looking for partners, we are looking for help. Uh, one moment, please. I'll be reconnected in 10 seconds. One moment. One moment. One moment. This meeting is being recorded. You can hear us? You have been removed from the meeting. This call will now okay, be disconnected. You, can hear us, but you have been removed from the meeting. Goodbye. Okay. Then let's, if you can hear us, and there is, a, hopefully the echo is not that bad, let's just take those questions. 
type them into the chat. Online. Uh, yeah. Let's just try one first. Uh, let's try um, Joseph Noll, please uh, go ahead. Hey, Joseph Noll, professor at the University of Oslo and secretary general of the Basic Internet Foundation. Uh, I'd like to address, I'd like to really love your statement on everyone can use the internet inclusively, but I still see that in Africa, South of Sahara, the costs of access are predominantly, well, doing something against it. Or to put it this way, our SDG 9C uh, of 2020 isn't anywhere close in reach. So don't you think we need a paradigm shift when it comes to the access to the internet and perhaps think about the model of the road? Okay, thank you. Let's just take three and then um, Amadeep can answer those three. So the next person was um, Henriette. Um, thank you, Shangatai. I Can you hear me? Good. My internet yes. has been so bad. So apologies, I'm not putting my video on. Thanks very much, um, Amam Deep and everyone. This is Anriet Esterhuisen, um, Association for Progressive Communications and past chair of the IGF MAG. Um, I want to home in on your emphasis, which I'm very happy about, on this idea of the internet as a public infrastructure and as a kind of commons. You know, and I think what we've seen is an um, um, increased understanding or, or acknowledgement of this being um, uh, important and valid way of looking at the IGF, but difficulty in how to deal with that on a day-to-day -day basis, considering the multi-stakeholder nature of the internet, the fact that it's a public infrastructure, but not owned um, and operated to controlled by the public sector, but by multiple different sectors. Um, the the uh, digital cooperation process so far, the, the, the thread on commons, have looked at using the internet as a platform for creating a digital commons, knowledge commons, for example. Is the GDC an opportunity for us to actually explore how we can agree on principles so that we govern um, the internet and ultimately also regulate it when it has to be regulated, which, which sometimes might be necessary, sometimes not, but as a commons or a global public good. So in other words, Imam Deep, is this the opportunity for us to take that leap to not just look at the internet as a way of building the commons, but as a commons itself. Uh, thank you, Henriette. The last person would be uh, Jerry Ellis. Hello, I can hear you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, I'm blind, living in Ireland. Um, I'm with the Dynamic Coalition on Accessibility and Disability in the IGF process. And I'm basically wondering how can the compact and all the other processes, which were really sound very interesting, but how can we ensure that people with disabilities are not excluded? For instance, I was at the WIS in 2003 and in 2005 and any number of meetings since then. And still we find that meetings are inaccessible. I don't know if there's sign language for this meeting. We find that uh, registration processes are inaccessible. We find that documentation is inaccessible. And then the output frequently does not include our needs. So how can we ensure that all the processes that we heard about today will be accessible to the wide number of people with disabilities? Thank you. And if I may request, could Joseph repeat his question, please? Because I only got the last part, it was the paradigm shift. Um, I, I'm sorry for that. Yes, um, my starting point was that when I look at the connectivity numbers in Africa, South of Sahara, we see that we are not anywhere close of an inclusive internet access because the costs of access are basically hindering an uptake. And so my, my question was, shouldn't we uh, look at the paradigm shift like applying the model of the road for the internet? Thanks. So let me try and answer that. Uh, and for the sake of everyone else, I mean, we made progress during the COVID. So there's been a COVID boost to connectivity. 
but that's kind of tapering off. Uh, and uh, if current rates continue, then you know we will not achieve uh, uh, universal coverage by 2030. And in Asia, uh, in, there is a gap, particularly within Asia, there is a big gap. And in Africa, there is a kind of uh, a larger gap in terms of connectivity. Overall, there is a rural urban gap. There is a gender divide. So connectivity remains a huge, universal connectivity remains a huge channel, challenge. I would agree that we need a paradigm shift. We need a paradigm shift in the following ways. One is the more intelligent combination of technologies. You have the old copper, the current fiber, but you have new opportunities that are coming up. Uh, uh, satellites are opening up another opportunity, but the costs remain high. Uh, hopefully they'll fall, um, but how can we combine different technologies that are available uh, today uh, and get more community engagement uh, uh, in, in terms of the deployment of these technologies? The other challenge is finance, which is where a lot of countries in Africa are struggling. Um, there is um, uh, increasing attention being paid to investments into digital in advanced economies. Uh, the EU recovery funds, for instance, uh, one-fourth to one-third, uh, take Spain, for instance, are going into digital. Uh, but uh, the, uh, this, this kind of stimulus remains limited to OECD countries. Uh, in African countries, you have, uh, uh, and in many Asian countries, in small island developing states, you have a crisis today in which uh, allocation need to be made for food imports, need to be made to service debt because incomes fell during the pandemic, uh, government expenditure rose, so, so you have a fiscal problem today. So today their finances not, are not in a good shape and we really need, the SG has called for an SDG stimulus. We need the international financial institutions to step up uh, so that uh, uh, these countries can have some elbow room for these critical investments into uh, the future. Uh, the third paradigm shift we need uh, is around collaborations. And this is... Uh, Pablo, your microphone is on. Can you switch it off, please? So I was saying collaborations. That's the third important piece. And uh, colleagues from the ITU got us together in Kigali, partnered to connect. Uh, and uh, we've been um, uh, working with, in follow-up to uh, an important section of the 2019 report of the High-Level Panel on Digital Cooperation, we've been working with uh, UNICEF and ITU and others on the Giga Connect initiative, which is about school connectivity. So these are kind of bottom-up initiatives where you try and stimulate demand and aggregate demand. Now, uh, why is this important? Because you, you need the top-down supply side solutions, uh, the, um, uh, but this needs to be complemented by uh, the bottom-up demand type of solutions. Um, uh, you know, even those with limited resources, when they see the critical need, uh, critical importance of digital for accessing healthcare, education, etc. They will find the resources, uh, and as costs come down, you know that demand at the bottom of the pyramid, if it's aggregated well, becomes a very important pull on investments into connectivity. So those are the three aspects of this uh, paradigm shift in in my view. But this is a critical challenge that Joseph has highlighted. On Anriyate's point about, I can only say yes to that, uh, that uh, the Global Digital Compact is the opportunity. Uh, it's a critical opportunity to put down those principles uh, that move us in the direction of a uh, commons view. Uh, so um, it is not only about building the commons, but it's about having this commons, this commons framework uh, for 
governance, also for leveraging digital technologies for making progress on the uh, SDGs. And it fits in with the rest of the vision in uh, the uh, common um, agenda. Now, this is at the level of principles, a little abstract perhaps, but I think we should all put our minds together and our resources together to come up with some concrete examples of how this commons approach work, both on the challenge side, on the governance side, and also on the uh, opportunity side. So for instance, on the opportunity side, can we, as recommended in the 2019 report, look at building a digital commons architecture where data and AI are treated as a resource for public good? Uh, so in some spaces, whether it's public health, pandemic preparedness and response, disaster resilience, uh, the green transition, building a circular economy, I think it makes sense for us to create these spaces where data is pulled together, human capacity comes together, benchmarks and governance standards are put together in, um, in a collaborative way so that you really have a common space. So this will help us concretize this vision of uh, uh, the internet as public infrastructure, internet as global commons. This also has a political uh, utility in the sense of uh, fragmentation of approaches to, the, to internet governance, uh, dealing with content, uh, dealing with data protection, et cetera. Yes, there will be regional, national particularities for political, cultural, economic reasons, but we need to maintain that, um, that universal character of the, uh, the internet for a variety of reasons. And finally, uh, Jerry's important question on how do we make sure that uh, disability does not come in the way of engagement. Uh, so, uh, uh, this is critical advice uh, that, uh, Jerry, you are offering at this stage. Uh, I've not had the time uh, yet to look into the details, but I promise that, you know, we'll come back on this. I did have a conversation on some of the tech solutions that are available today. And frankly, I came away from that conversation a little confused. Uh, because um, uh, people with disabilities are still not convinced that some of those tech solutions that uh, you, you, start, you started seeing in the private sector uh, are um, uh, really helpful. So help me again, if you can, if uh, you, know, you can plug us into networks who can give us some concrete ideas, concrete guidance on how do we make sure uh, that firstly, the inputs are there and uh, we bring together some uh, some resources at our end to gather those inputs to make them uh, uh, you know to to have them taken into account make them heard and then also the other aspect of making sure that participation access issues are sorted out from registration to actual speaking intervention uh, opportunities. Uh, thank you very much for those answers. Uh, the next three is uh, are Christine Arida, Brandon Sullivan, and then Chris Buckridge. So, Christine, you have the floor. Thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, you can. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, um, first, I, I would like to thank uh, Ambassador Gill for uh, for uh, coming uh, to this uh, town hall and for exchanging this information with the IGF community. Um, and I'm uh, Christine Arita. I, um, I'm from the government of Egypt. I work for the National Telecom Regulatory Authority, and uh, I represent the government of Egypt uh, on the MAG as a, co as a previous host of the IGF. Um, so my, my first question is about, um, um, Ambassador Gill, you mentioned the national and regional IGFs and their importance. 
and uh, my question would be um, in respect to the consultations that will be taking place over the coming uh, uh, months, uh, how is it foreseen uh, to connect the different regional consultations that will happen with the work that's actually happening at grassroots level uh, within uh, the national and regional IGFs? Because as you uh, rightly mentioned, there's a lot of knowledge and a lot of dialogue that's happening and that has been happening on that front. And I think it would be um, a pity not to uh, channel that uh, within the consultation process that is happening. Uh, uh, the other point is um, about uh, uh, the key thematic issues that are mentioned. Uh, I mean, in Egypt, we do welcome uh, the consultation process that is taking place and uh, uh, the, the chance to actually uh, put in some knowledge there. Um, I think, uh, and we also, we also welcome the issue of connectivity, which is a very important thing. I think we just need to uh, also, as we look at this paradigm shift, uh, look more at meaningful access, not just access. That's uh, one very important issue, but also I think it's very important to focus within uh, uh, the policy uh, uh, points on um, uh, on the, the issue of development within all different uh, uh, key uh, issues, not only within access. I mean, development should remain at the forefront uh, of uh, or a cross-cutting issue within all the different uh, uh, seven key issues. Thank you very much. Brandon? Thank you so much. Uh, just checking if you all can hear me uh, clearly. Uh, excellent. Uh, so hello, um, morning, afternoon, wherever you are sitting right now. My name is Brandon Sullivan. I'm with Wikimedians of the Caribbean, but I'm actually currently sat here in Boston, Massachusetts. Just a quick question um, to everyone in the room, but um, especially you, um, USG Gill, also great to see you again. We had a chat in New York. Um, speaking to this idea of connecting high level conversations with more grassroots conversations, I, you know, in sort of hearing everyone's um, thoughts on the matter, I got to thinking about how we could or the possibilities that exist for um, connecting epistemic communities, that being academia, and also those dealt in knowledge creation online. You know, I sit in um, a capacity that affords me access to and proximity to people on platforms like Wikipedia and Wikimedia um, Commons writ large and epistemic communities, of course, Massachusetts and other places are known for a sort of brain trust. Um, but those voices aren't oftentimes sat within these kinds of rooms. And, you know, in my mind, I'm sort of trying to think through the ways in which we could have these kinds of conversations um, being built into this development of the GDC and forward engagement, um, what are the channels that we can take advantage of in terms of, you know, um, building in and dialing in more collaboration at that stead and, you know, um, you know, some, some sort of, um, you know, path and process would be um, greatly appreciated. And of course, we'd love to know more about what those opportunities look like. So uh, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Chris. Yeah, thanks, Chengatai. Um, thank you, uh, Ambassador Gill, for this this session. I think it's been really useful. Um, I work for Ripen CC, one of the regional internet registries, um, also on the IGF Mag um, in the technical community stakeholder group. Uh, I think, well, from sort of beginning of WISIS, from the Tunis agenda, we've had that strong commitment to an endorsement of a multi-stakeholder approach to internet governance at the UN level. Um, but I, I think what, what I've seen, what I, I think we've all seen in recent years is as the challenges have become more urgent, more difficult, more sort of complex, um, finding true multi-stakeholder governance solutions has proven very difficult, particularly developing new multi-stakeholder models and processes. Um, so I, it, I'm asking a very broad question here, I realize, but I'd be really interested in your reflections on your role in terms of helping to facilitate the development of that multi-stakeholder approach and, and maybe your your views on the sort of health of that commitment to a multi-stakeholder approach in the UN system. Because um, I think that we've seen some concerns, I've had some concerns um, of, of that and of that commitment um, that everyone has had there. So. Would be really interested to hear your views on that. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you. And let me start with the last question uh, from, uh, from Chris. Uh, so I have no hesitation in saying that that commitment to multi-stakeholder approaches is very, very strong. Uh, in fact, when the SG spoke to the General Assembly, uh, he made it clear that uh, either we get to the GDC through a multi-stakeholder process or we don't uh, at all. So yeah, it, it was very, very clear, very strong statement uh, made in New York. And uh, we are uh, upholding that commitment through these consultations, for instance, many others, uh, through the strong engagement uh, with not just uh, uh, the IGF, but also other forums, I can. In terms of our work on the SDGs pillar, I'm convinced that across the priority areas of health, agriculture, food security, the green transition, humanitarian emergencies, and education, we need to have that multi-stakeholder approach uh, to design and to uh, implement. Uh, some work we started on design principles for taking digital into some of these development domains. Again, uh, uh, that's being done uh, through multi-stakeholder uh, participation. So um, having led the multi-stakeholder initiative past three years in Geneva, I know how critical that is. It's not just a slogan for me. It is lived experience. Uh, now, your question about how can we uh, kind of go beyond the uh, the ritual uh, obeisance to multi-stakeholder approaches, and how can we address this thing that is either or, there's either it's intergovernmental multilateralism or uh, it is multi-stakeholder um, uh, approaches, which end up being consultative, uh, interesting discussions, but what's the pathway to implementation? You know, we struggle uh, there. And frankly, no one has really cracked it, but some recent experiences are, are useful. There was the cybercrime discussion uh, where uh, you managed to get about 200 plus participants from uh, non-governmental origins who, who managed to have some say, a partner to connect in Kigali. Um, uh, that, uh, you know, again, you, you had uh, some, uh, some interesting and positive experiences. So let's give ourselves a challenge that as we go towards the Global Digital Compact, can we uh, do better? Uh, and also can we, in terms of the implementation of what's put out as those principles, can we uh, find ways to to kind of you know um, own up some parts uh, like the academic community is very good at doing independent research and analysis so can we bring some of that uh, evidence generation uh, to those regular discussions uh, civil society very good at keeping us honest reflecting some of uh, the concerns on the ground. So can we do that in ways that uh, uh, kind of help us make those uh, larger political policy assessments around focus? Then Brandon's point um, uh, about, um, Brandon, it's good to see you, about connecting these knowledge communities together. Which, which channels? Asking them to make specific things. I'm sure, you know, the health be exempt from it in terms of you know public spending are we looking at austerity uh, yeah i think that's yeah um so uh, isn't the igf community itself one of those channels for different knowledge communities to come together um so help me there brandon and others in the room uh because um this is more than an academic problem. It's a, it's a practical issue. Um, and then we have to think about our capacity to manage these channels. I think in the GDC context, you know, I've told you about a few of the New York channels in which knowledge will be constructed. Um, and then, you know, there are these regional 
uh, and goes back to Christina's point, national, regional, I just, again, you know, Christina, help me there. Uh, like, don't uh, only ask me what we can do, but also ask yourself what you can do. How can the national regional IGFs, um, now that you know the themes, the ideas, you know, the, can they, like we're doing with Adis Ababa, the agenda is aligned around some of these upcoming milestones. So can we use the opportunity to get together, let's say, the youth, uh, women, disabled uh, people whose voices are not generally heard, organize them together and come up with, you know, very, very, I mean, you have the framework in the public call for inputs, but go ahead, you know, if you want to adapt it, you want to keep it very simple, you know, what is it that you want to see? What is it that you don't want to see in terms of the digital future? And how do you want to get there? You know, what's the, what's the way in terms of whether it's governance or collaboration or, or, you know, what kind of common pieces you want to see. So keep it simple and let's make sure that um, uh, we bring all these diverse voices together. And yes, development as a cross-cutting area, uh, totally agree. I think for us in the office, there are two cross-cutting themes. One is of human rights and the other one is of sustainable development. Uh, so anything that we do or... Uh, uh, we partner on, we would look at um, these two guiding uh, sets of uh, values uh, for inspiration, for practical guidance. Uh, thank you very much for those answers. Um, now we go to this room. I think we have Canada and then Switzerland and Adam and then online, so we take four this time. Online, we will have, um, let me just, sorry. Um, uh, Mapeta Kumpula Natri. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for uh, giving me the floor. I won't take a lot of time because I believe we get lots of opportunity to speak to the tech envoy. Um, and first of all, I just wanted to thank uh, Ambassador Gill for taking some time this afternoon to meet uh, at the Canadian Mission with a number of uh, embassy colleagues. I just wanted to pick up on a couple of points because I think um, from a member state perspective, I think there's still some areas I think we, or I speak for Canada in this case, um, continue to look for clarity. And, and I know I've been tra tracing your um, tracing your your work since you've arrived. The clarity on the GDC process and the modalities, I know we are working towards that, but remains, um, I think, an issue for member states. Appreciating, and as my colleague said last week, that effective multilateralism relies on effective multi-stakeholderism. Um, but at the end of the day, and as I think you've articulated, this will be a political declaration signed by member states. So I can only merely reinforce that I think we're looking for as much clarity as at the earliest possible convenience on some of these key issues. And I think this reflected a conversation we had on the way over, which is I know that the PGA has announced the Summit of the Future um, and we have co-facilitators and I believe there will be modalities for the summit itself. But I think we do need to pay attention that um, the digital ecosystem is quite unique and whether we do need to look at specific modalities um, for the GDC itself. Uh, I don't have a position on this issue, but I think it is one that we should be looking at um, cautiously and carefully. So I guess, uh, and the one question I wanted to put to you, it's a bit of a loaded question because we just finished talking about, about this, but I would be interested in your views about what is the relationship between the eventual GDC and the WISIS plus 20 process? Um, one, this is, an, you know, the tech envoy itself and the GDC and the summit are both uh, new pieces on the chessboard that didn't exist uh, when WISIS was created 20, well, almost 20 years ago. Um, what do you see as sort of the future of these two things um, as they sort of come together almost uh, around the same moment? Thank you. Nicoletta Catrine uh, with AI and Faith from United States based in Switzerland. My question, uh, thank you very much, first of all, Ambassador Gil. I really loved very much your presentation and um, it gives a clear idea about the lines along this global digital digit uh, compact vision it's developed. Um, I, I was wondering um, about the role of faiths 
and religious actors in this consultational process along the two lines, harnessing digital uh, transformation to sustain the SDGs. And I'm thinking that religious actors were all being on the ground doing already this kind, kind of work but also from an um, invest, investment point of view, because they are very active in everything. It's uh, impact investing and uh, um, investing in local communities. And in regard, of course, with the um, challenges, uh, the governance pillar with um, AI, uh, ethics, values, and human rights, how do you consider to integrate the voice of these uh, uh, faith-based actors in this consultational process? Thank you. Adam. Adam. Hello, Adam Peake. Um, I work for ICANN, but I'm here today speaking as a MAG member from the technical community. Um, uh, um, Ambassador Gill, thank you for holding the consultation. And your question, who has cracked it? I think I think the, the answer is perhaps Wissus. I remember sitting in a, actually not sitting in a room, sitting in the corridors for five days outside a meeting room where the first meetings, uh, preparatory meetings for Wissus were held in 2003. And we sat outside of the room waiting for a decision about whether we would participate. By the end of that process in Tunis, we, as non-governmental actors, had been given access to the floor to speak to the chair, to have our documentation as a full part of the record. And I think we've seen some steps back from that full level of participation, multi-stakeholder participation since then. Um, but I think it's an excellent example that at the end of the day, while of course, governments had the priority in the room. Their heads of states were signing off on those documents and responsible for those documents. Those documents did have uh, the, the, a full multi-stakeholder uh, support and consultation behind them, which goes to the point that the uh, representative of Canada has made that effective multilateralism um, depends on multi-stakeholders, I think. And so we do have that connection, and I hope we can learn from WISIS and perhaps return to some of those modalities that we achieved in Tunis. Um, but I did want to ask specifically, as a member of the tech community, um, how do you see us being involved in the consultations and preparations for the summit for the future uh, of the future uh, and the GDC? We, we as a group, operate uh, and function on a global multi-stakeholder basis, and our processes are multi-stakeholder, global and inclusive. You've mentioned some regional consultations. We could, of course, and shall, I hope, participate in those um, as we function across regions, but I wonder if there's any particular role that you see for our technical uh, community in, this, in these uh, consultations, given our global remit for these resources. Thank you. Mia Petra. Yes, hello. Um, my name is Mia Petra Kumpula Natri, and I'm speaking as a head of delegation from the European Parliament, as a member of Parliament taking part in IGF for uh, becoming months or uh, after a month or so. So I will squeeze my question to very short, as there has been good debate, and I also need to uh, leave the meeting in, in time. So uh, the greetings is that we are working here daily on the UN values and principles also with the legislation. And I think the GDCs are very, very important uh, or is a very good uh, opportunity to update all the UN values and principles for the uh, time of the digitalization and then uh, namely on the online life as, as the states and, and people uh, it was named here the women and girls, so everyone can have the, the principles respected also online life. But then my question for the, the new tech envoy would be that what is your wish for the uh, parliamentary uh, participants for the IGF and in general? Because uh, I think that it is important also that they feel uh, importance of the IGF in, in uh, this multi-stakeholder basis for the internet, but then also putting these uh, things in action sometimes also requires legislation. And thank you for organizing this. Thank you very much. Again, very thoughtful interventions. Um, 
the the point made by Canada about the need for clarity on the global digital compact. Uh, so this is a process that is just about to start. And I have to be careful here as the secretariat. This is a process that the member states uh, own. After all, it's a summit of heads of state, heads of government, uh, and uh, there will be a process that uh, uh, the PGA uh, will uh, steer on behalf of all member states and that the secretariat will support. Uh, so uh, some aspects of that process are clear today. They have been mentioned in the resolution of 8 September in a generic way. But then some specific aspects, David, you know, at uh, uh, at a personal level as Amandeep, I can agree with you that the digital ecosystem is unique, that you need to perhaps come out with some specific modalities. But this is a decision that uh, the appropriate uh, forum, the appropriate process needs to, uh, uh, to take. Uh, as I said, the Secretary General has emphasized this specificity uh, and we'll uh, continue to do so. We'll continue to support member states in ensuring that the digital track is, uh, is handled in, uh, in the manner that all our previous experiences and uh, um, uh, Adam, you pointed out the WISIS experience. I've heard this in New York that the WISIS Tunis formula is a good one um, for multi-stakeholder participation. You know, you know that formulation within our respective uh, mandates and authorities. Uh, I don't have the exact wording before me, uh, but for some, that formula doesn't go far enough. Others, it goes too far. So let's see where we end up with. That's one of those good examples to, to look at. I mentioned two recent um, uh, experiences, other experiences, rel relatively positive, the cybercrime discussion and the ITU discussion. So maybe we can come up with a sui generis formula uh, that satisfies David, Adam, and everyone else uh, on, on this uh, aspect. The, the relationship with VISIS plus 20, uh, again, I want to be very careful about another process that's been decided, approved by member states that has its own dynamics, its own history, a very, very important history. And tomorrow, in fact, I'll be with colleagues at UNCTAD, uh, at the CSTD, uh, which has had uh, a role in that uh, process. There are um, these important action lines. Uh, and I think uh, on the development agenda that was emphasized by our colleague from Egypt, uh, again, WISIS has certain strengths that we need to, uh, to preserve and take into the future. Now, the, the member states are, are sovereign. The leaders as the representatives of member states will discuss um, what shape or form the GDC takes, what shape or form the processes in the future around this uh, take. I gave you a little bit of a flavor of uh, the history, the context of this, uh, this more recent discussion. Uh, so without losing sight of the, uh, the experience of the past, how can we make sure that these different processes are aligned together so we build synergy across these different tracks uh, and we do not have repetitive uh, discussions so those are uh, important considerations over the next uh, couple of years uh, adam you asked about you know how do you see the role of the tech community uh, i've had a very good discussion with the ican team uh, so i'm very familiar with the strengths of the tech community. I think uh, the tech community uh, needs to uh, bring forth uh, its understanding of how we are doing with the current architecture and the protocols around the internet, how emerging technologies are having uh, an impact. Uh, I mean, some of it is hype, others is getting closer to reality. Um, uh, you know, Web 3.0, uh, 
the intelligent networks of tomorrow. So uh, we need a nuanced uh, but accessible reflection from the tech community for the policy level. Uh, that, you know, heads of state and heads of government ministers can wrap their minds around. Okay, this is how we've been used to thinking about the internet. Most of this is likely to endure, but there are some aspects that will change. Uh, for instance, um, uh, the, the aspect of security. Uh, today, you have more and more companies and countries interested in uh, security by hardware design so that you overcome some of the problems with the current generation of in, uh, of networks. So they, these are some of the issues that the tech community needs to kind of reflect on over the next one year. And uh, um, these are my thoughts. Maybe the, you, you and your colleagues can get together and come up with other areas where the inputs uh, would be uh, helpful, would be useful. And then two other very important stakeholders were mentioned faith-based organizations and parliamentarians. I agree entirely with the distinguished MEP uh, that uh, uh, we need to uh, build capacity among parliamentarians to think uh, in a nuanced manner about digital governance, about regulation. Uh, the tools that we are used to from the 20th century, 19th century even, they are insufficient. Uh, they do not ad uh, are not ad adequate to address the challenges we face today. So how do we look at competition policy and consumer protection together in a new way? Uh, so these are reflections that parliamentarians would have to have. Some parliaments already have those. You know, there are bills under discussion um, in the European context, in the Brazilian context, Indian context, many other parliaments are having those uh, discussions. Parliamentary research services, are, are, train, are putting more human resources into this. Uh, our colleagues at the IPU have several initiatives related to, to digital. We will try and engage you know, within our uh, um, limits and our resources with some of uh, these initiatives and make sure that I've met a number of MPs myself and those meetings will, uh, will continue to make sure that how uh, the, the parliamentary perspective, the legislative perspective is reflected in the GDC in a good way. Uh, on faith-based organizations, uh, the ethics dimension, um, th that's very, very important. Uh, in fact, um, uh, I cannot name names, but we have some visits planned uh, with, the, uh, with the senior leaders from faith-based organizations. Uh, there have been very, very important reflections uh, made, for instance, uh, uh, in the Vatican context, uh, in the context of uh, other leaders, uh, Buddhist, uh, Hindu, uh, Islamic uh, uh, leaders. Uh, there, are, uh, there are advantages in uh, drilling down to the bedrock of human values and placing the GDC uh, uh, in in those foundations and faith-based organizations uh, can help us drill down to those shared human uh, values thanks uh, thank you uh, we only have two for the next round unless somebody wants to bond. okay uh, so we have uh, Roz Kenny Birch uh, Giles Bach and Great. Hello, can all hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, my name is Roz Kennyberg. I'm an international policy advisor from the UK Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport. I'm tuning in from Heathrow Airport on my way to Geneva, so apologies for any background noise. Um, just to say that your emphasis on the IGF's national and regional initiatives is very welcome. And to reiterate comments from others on this call, uh, we see the multi-stakeholder model as key, and it is important that the Global Digital Compact is developed, formulated, and delivered through such an approach, welcoming views from across communities. 
Given the broad remit of the compact and following on from that point, I wanted to ask how you and your team plan to avoid duplication with other related UN digital initiatives. Thanks very much and thanks again for organizing this extremely helpful session. Uh, thank you, Jasper. Do you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, yeah. Good afternoon and thank you very much for this exchange today. I am Gilles Barr and I am uh, teaching cyber ethics at Globetics.net and we are an NGO based in Geneva, specializing in ethics in general and in higher education in particular. And therefore my question would be, how is currently the higher education sector engaged in this overall process? And as well, I extend my question um, following the comments on the uh, connections with the tech community. How are the big uh, tech um, multinational corporations directly as well engaged and involved in this uh, overall process. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. And next, oh, sorry. Um... And I have mine from the One Goal Initiative. It aims to uh, cover some risks that are not covered by the SDGs. Now, um, you mentioned um, the importance of not um, multiplying uh, effort uh, in a redundant manner. Uh, I have uh, this year at the WISIS, I've uh, conducted a workshop on consolidation and that has uh, this very uh, goal. And um, I was gonna ask if you have uh, any uh, efforts going on in the same direction. And the uh, um, conceptual thinking requirement uh, in order to be able to achieve that and, and to also uh, actually uh, find the um, uh, the problem that we need to solve in, in, a, in a global view. Um, how may I explain that? Uh, when uh, we are talking about any subject, uh, immediately we want to have you know concrete uh, issues and concrete examples to deal with. Um, in doing so, in proceeding that in that manner, uh, we uh, lose sight of the entirety of the system, and th that can that can. Um, mislead us over time uh, in, in a in a slightly wrong direction and i wanted to also uh, underline the importance of um, bringing forth a a, a, a process of uh, requiring uh, disclosures um, really deep disclosures about uh, affiliations um, uh, a, a, um, also uh, allegiances, projects, uh, in investments, uh, dependencies, that kind of stuff, uh, so that when we are in a discussion, we can, uh, in real time, you know, in the discussion, when somebody says something, we can immediately uh, know or look up what uh, this person um, brings uh, as a load to carry on their backs. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ken, some very thoughtful interventions. Um, I think national regional IJFs, yes, agreed. Uh, uh, let's make it work. Uh, I mean, uh, we are over this uh, problem of uh, do they matter, how do they matter? Let's, let's just make it work and let's use uh, the convenings over the coming months uh, to get more of these grassroots voices into the conversation. Uh, and I've heard this from some of the civil society members of the IGF uh, community uh, that sometimes, you know, this is uh, uh, something that they wish for. So let's use the opportunity. On this aspect of uh, duplication, we are very, very conscious of that. 
uh, the GDC process is a unique process. There is, uh, you know, no other process like that. So at that level, you know, so don't worry, there is no risk of duplication. Um, and there is a clear delineation of responsibility from the Secretary General uh, in this uh, regard. Within the um, uh, outcomes that have been mentioned in uh, the Common Agenda report, uh, there is again a clear delineation of responsibilities. So the, um, uh, the aspect of misinformation, disinformation, the uh, uh, Department of Global Communications is in the lead and my office is in a supporting role there. UNESCO will be in a supporting role there. Uh, and uh, likewise on these issues of international security, lethal autonomous weapon systems, issues that I've dealt with in the past, uh, it's clearly Izumi Nakamitsu, the high representative for disarmament affairs, who's in the lead. You know, where we come in from the office of the tech envoy is issues around digital trust and and security. Frankly, our resources are so limited that we don't have the the luxury of you know uh, getting too too uh, too much beyond the uh, the demarcated uh, lines. Uh, it's also going to be, as I mentioned, it's going to be one of the three pillars of this office's work. Uh, so, on a long term basis, avoiding this kind of overlap, duplication sending conflicting messages to uh, to member states and other uh, partners so that's going to be part of the it's not a very un not a very pleasant task often but it's a necessary uh, uh, necessary one uh, on the role of the higher education we already have universities stepping forward uh, to help us host some consultations there was a mapping exercise of digital cooperation that was done by students from a higher education uh, institute. Uh, so they want to carry that forward with the help of their professors. If Gilbert, you have some ideas, you can volunteer uh, and please step forward. So that's it. That's, you know, you'll hear me repeat that like a broken record. You know, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do, you know, the same, same thing. And so uh, give me advice, but also give me concrete things. Uh, uh, you know, so uh, it will be helpful. Uh, big tech, yes, big tech is stepping forward uh, into conversations, uh, but we need to go beyond big tech. We need to go to medium tech, small tech, uh, tech outside uh, the Silicon Valley and have more diverse participation in those conversations. Sometimes, you know, you have, you hear very different perspectives from tech companies from Asia, Africa, you know, uh, from China, India, from South Africa, Brazil, you hear different perspectives. We need to have those perspectives in. Uh, and uh, I also need to see that this is beyond, uh, you know, CSR or public relations, that this is truly, I mean, what is the meaning of multi-stakeholderism? That, you know, we all have stakes in those outcomes and we step forward and, uh, put some skin in the game. So I need to see some skin in the game. You know, governments are definitely putting skin in the game. Uh, so so are others. But, you know, uh, we need to see more skin in the game going beyond some of these kind of like, you know, I just want to be able to handle the regulatory, uh, 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 you know, uh, impact on my business model to, okay, it's about the digital future it matters to us all and we have a duty to our societies uh, to our uh, to our planet and we need to uh, put in our bit as well particularly when you have the resources uh, so the resources at the command of some of these companies are the envy of more than 150 countries around the world so let's see a little bit of of that uh, Madam, your question, I didn't quite understand, but I thought maybe you were um, you were emphasizing the importance of a gestalt approach that don't break up the pieces, you know, keep the whole big picture in mind. And the other thing that you emphasized was the importance of radical transparency. Put your interests on the table. Where are you coming from? Put it on the table so that I can see them. No, po uh, no, no problem in having different interests. You know, we all have 
agendas, frankly, but put them on the table so that I can see, you know, what the agenda is. And then, you know, we can negotiate uh, uh, around that. Maybe that is, and I didn't quite get uh, the goal of the one goal initiative. So there are some risks that are not covered by the SDGs. Can you give a concrete example without breaking the Gestalt picture? Uh, yeah, without breaking, that's going to be difficult. Uh, as soon as you give an example, you break <laughs> the Gestalt. Um, the example that I uh, generally give when um, required to do so is um, uh, the rebound effect as applied to um, energy efficiency. Uh, the more uh, efficient we make our devices, and we are right now um, putting a lot of effort into that, uh, the more devices we end up using. And not only then uh, do we use more energy than we otherwise would have, um, but we also uh, make our functions per unit of function, if you so wish, more energy intensive, therefore also more dependent on continued energy supply. And when there is a glitch, we have a larger uh, damage. So that's one example. I hope this helps. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um. We are almost out of time, but last question goes to Giacomo, please. Thank you. Uh, yes, the, the, I see in all you have presented something that is um, missing or at least left apart and is the contents. Uh, I'm co-chair of the uh, policy network on meaningful access. And we are seeing, and you will see in the report that we are working on in these days, that one of the ceiling that we have in the access process is the fact that there, are, there is a lack of services and local contents in the internet. So the people say, why I have to go on the internet if there is no, I cannot access because I cannot understand and there are not the services that I need for. So this, I think, is an issue that needs to be uh, need to be addressed. And linked to that, there is also the question that um, is linked to the media. I think that uh, one of the lacking partner in all the process of the internet governance, all of them, including WSIS, including the IGF, has been the lack of attention from the media and the lack of a uh, strong dialogue with the media. And without the media, uh, I don't think that we can go very far. That's my impression, I'm biased because I worked for media since 40 years, but I have to acknowledge my conflict of interest. No, no excellent points. Uh, media, I think faith-based organizations, parliamentarians, so it's a critical uh, partner, and particularly in the context of misinformation, disinformation, so capacity building there, we can't do it without engaging the traditional forms of media, journalists, et cetera. And I would add one more aspect to it, which is that um, uh, media is playing a role in shaping the public consciousness on, on digital. And even in the best newspapers, you see a kind of um, uh, hype. Uh, there is, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's like... Uh, there is science reporting, there is tech reporting, which is very helpful right, on a day-to-day -day basis. But then often it's, it's about, you know, um, yeah, it, it, we are building a new kind of narrative around some of these tech heroes. Uh, there are many other heroes, and we need to be very nuanced in terms of how we understand AI, for instance. And media hasn't played a, a kind of, you know, not all media, but some media have played a role in kind of presenting AI in a way which misleads us about the trueness. So I um, couldn't agree more that we need to engage media. It's a very, very important uh, partner uh, on the GDC uh, as well and the pact on uh, the integrity of public information. Uh, on content, uh, uh, in fact, earlier today, there was having, we were having a discussion on digital divide. So there is the connectivity divide there's the meaningful affordable access divide. And then, according to me, there is the content divide. 
who's generating content, who's consuming content, in what language, in what cultural context. And you know, we are losing some of the cultural diversity around the world. So how can we uh, preserve that? Uh, um, and then there is the issue of who's generating the data, who's ge deriving value from data. So these are kind of nuances within the, this very broad paradigm of digital divide. Uh, so uh, we need to focus laser-like on this issue. And how do we reflect it in the GDC? And more importantly, how do we take action already, even before the GDC on on this issue. Um, it also has a practical significance, which is that if you don't have enough diverse data sets, your solutions in terms of you know, AI for health, AI for education, uh, data for this, that, or the other, they are not going to be impactful enough. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, how is the, is the question? Thank you very much, Under Secretary K. General Gill. Um, I'd like to thank you all. We are now over time, and I'd like to all, thank you all for coming here, and I'd like to thank those people who are online as well, and I'd like to thank the Under Secretary General for taking time out of his busy schedule to come and meet with us. That's very much appreciated. Um, thank you, and we'll see you, and we'll see you in Addis. <laughs> right. It's <laughs>